But um, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about Plunky 2. Um, and so I think, uh, so we, we at Polygon Zero have, have built these two um, CKP libraries, Plunky 2 and Starkey. Um, and so I think that we can look at them as representing a new approach to building uh, vastly more performant snarks and starks. Um, so Plunky 2 is a library um, that combines Plonk and Fry, uh, and Starkey is a library that uh, focuses on Stark or on air-based Starks um, and supports uh, recursive verification of, of air-based Starks. Um, and so this approach, I think, is characterized by uh, using small fields and then recursive Fry. Um, and so what does this mean? Uh, Fry allows us to use much smaller fields than uh, elliptic curve-based proof systems. So we can use this really interesting field that has uh, that's characterized by prime order to the 64 minus to the 32 plus one. Um, and the difference is that that allows us to um, to take advantage of, of structure and how CPUs work and um, speed up field uh, arithmetic uh, really considerably. And so at the same time, we have this um, trade-off that's uh, really interesting that Fry uh, provides, which is um, by changing what's called the blow-up factor in Fry, uh, we can have, uh, on the one hand, either fast provers, um, but really big proofs, um, or slow provers uh, and smaller proofs. Um, and so up until now, uh, protocols that have used Fry have had to sort of pick some point in the middle of this trade-off where, like for instance, if you're, um, uh, if you need to verify something on Ethereum, uh, your blow-up factor has to be um, big enough that the proof size will be small enough to verify on Ethereum, um, but not so big that your statement uh, takes forever to prove. Um, and so for the first time um, with Plonky 2, we can uh, avoid this trade-off using recursion. So um, we can take uh, the complicated statement that we need to prove, and we could use a really low blow-up factor. Um, and so we can have a really fast proof, uh, but one that's way too big to be verified by an end user or on Ethereum. Um, but we can wrap it in a smaller recursive proof. Uh, and so this allows us to sort of take advantage of both sides of this trade-off where we can have uh, really fast proofs and um, still sort of shrink them uh, so that they're more usable. Um, and uh, it allows us to sort of pick and go back and forth between using Planck and air arithmetizations. Um, so like for instance, for uh, we have this virtual machine that we use to um, to compile uh, Solidity or Yule to um, to verify Ethereum transactions, uh, and so we can use Air for that because fundamentally, like our routing model, like each step of the VM only needs access to like the previous step and the next step, um, and so we don't have to pay the cost uh, like in Plonk where we can route uh, gates to uh, any arbitrary other gate. Um, and so there's it, Plunky 2 exposes this flexibility uh, that's really useful. So the result of all of this is that we can have uh, lightning fast zero knowledge proofs um, with uh, no trusted setup. It's fully transparent, just like Starks. Um, and on Plunky 2, we have best uh, in class recursion performance. So um, uh, it takes 170 milliseconds to uh, generate a recursive proof on a MacBook Pro, um, and we expect that this uh, over the next like month or so will um, will decrease pretty dramatically as well. And so um, a really interesting uh, aspect of this, like pre uh, prior to to working on Polygon Zero, we were working on um, uh, this protocol Mir, which was uh, used like the Zexy style. Um, a uh, single level of recursion and then recursive aggregation. Um, and what we found was really uh, annoying about that was that when you use recursion with um, EC-based schemes, um, you generally, you, you either have to pay the price of using a single curve and having a non-native multiplication that's expensive to um, 
to do in circuit, or you have to have a, a cycle of curves. Um, and the problem is that uh, like you sort of have to keep track of uh, which curve you're in, um, which uh, is annoying because like we wanted to uh, perform some computation in the inner proof, um, but then inline some like computation in the outer proof, um, but still like using the same Merkle tree and state and accumulators. Um, and, uh, but those uh, scalar fields were, were different. And so we weren't able to do that. Um, and so with Planky 2, uh, we only have uh, a single field for everything. Um, and moreover, you know, not to take anything uh, away from Halo, but uh, we fully verify um, each proof, like like every recursive step represents like the full verification of uh, whatever proof is being verified. And so we don't have to worry about um, having accumulators or deferred computation or combining accumulators. Um, and so uh, for us, like the, the, this is something that, that makes sense and, and it's nice. Um, and so Planky 2 is natively Ethereum compatible. So right now we estimate, we, we haven't done the, um, the EVM verifier, but it's a very straightforward port to um, verify a bunch of Ketchak hashes. Um, and it costs, we estimate it costs about a million gas to verify. Um, although we're currently working on a project with um, Hermes, uh, who's also using the, the Goldilocks field um, to reduce this uh, really dramatically. So there's a really obvious trade-off whenever you use Fry, which is that uh, the proof sizes um, are really a lot bigger than um, EC-based schemes. Um, I would say that uh, that proof sizes, like eventually you're going to be, like, like a lot of people are focused on proof sizes and sort of, um, you know, how many proofs they can fit in a block, but uh, like past a certain point, usually it's like 100 TPS, you'll still be bound by verifier time. Um, and so with recursion, like there are ways where you can architect your protocol so that you aren't bound by proof sizes, that like you can have um, proofs routed to specific nodes that can um, aggregate. And so, uh, yeah, I have uh, maybe controversial opinions on how much proof size actually matters, but. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we are working on um, on uh, compressing um, proofs uh, even further so that they can be verified uh, cheaply on Ethereum. Um, one of the other downsides uh, is that um, on larger fields, we can define an elliptic curve directly on uh, on the scalar field of, of our curve that we're using in our proof system. Um, the uh, but the Goldilocks field is too small to to define an elliptic curve uh, directly, which is um, annoying because you want to be able to support uh, verifying EC signatures and um, Pedersen hashes. Uh, but there are two really interesting new papers that were recently submitted to ePrint where that show that we can uh, define curves that are secure over an extension field of the Goldilocks field, um, and so we can still uh, efficiently verify um, uh, EC arithmetic uh, in Planky 2 and, and Sparky proofs. So I think all of this, like the, the, the reason why we're so excited uh, about Planky 2 and about this approach is that uh, we view zero knowledge proofs as a sort of computing platform. Um, and throughout the history of, of technology, whether it's been the PC or mobile um, or, you know, games, uh, game consoles, uh, whenever you increase speed on a computing platform by 10x, um, you sort of like blow up in the, the design space for, for new applications. Um, and so Planky 2 represents like a 100x speed up in uh, recursion performance on Ethereum. Um, we It's like difficult to benchmark these things for other uh, arbitrary computations, but we think that uh, for general statements, um, it offers uh, a 100x speed up um, relative to, to other proof systems. Um, and uh, I think that we're just really excited about, um, about having uh, like such a huge speed up that, that is not 
uh, due to, to hardware acceleration or it's, it's simply um, software and, and on CPU. And, um, and we think that this is like a really promising approach for, um, for the space and for anyone building um, with, uh, with ZKPs and crypto. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to William. William, are you there? <laughs> William, I think you did. Yeah, I just managed to unmute myself. Okay, um, how do I share my screen? Uh, There's a little screen underneath the red line. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You. Oh. Can you see my slides? Well, no, we. Uh, Actually, I can, if you go into a slideshow, but then you probably can't see the screen. Um, is that okay for you or that looked yeah. good to us? Oh, that, that was okay? Like, yep. Can you see it now? This looks like a, your slide is, looks great. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll talk a bit more about Punky2 on the technical side and how we arrive at this design um, after having tried some other approaches to recursion. Um, so a quick recap on proof recursion. So in the proving system, you have two algorithms, uh, the prover and the verifier. And the prover um, outputs a proof pi, and the verifier verifies it. And the idea of proof recursion is to write this verifier algorithm inside the circuit, right? So, and then you can get a proof uh, capital pi that small pi is correct, okay? And this might not sound too impressive to just do like uh, one layer recursion like that, but this can apply to more than one proof. Um, you can have uh, a recursive proof that many uh, small proofs are correct. Um, and you can see how it can be useful in the, in the roll-up context. For example, uh, when you have a bunch of transaction proofs, well, you can compress them um, using a recursive proof that all these transaction proofs are correct. And so you compress all these transactions to just one proof that you can publish on the L1, for example, in the rollup context. Um, and so that sounds pretty easy to do, but in practice, uh, proof recursion is quite hard. Um, the main reason is that most proving systems are based on elliptic curves. And you might know that uh, an elliptic curve E has two fields. So there's the scalar field FP and the base field FQ. And uh, when you have a proving system over an elliptic curve, the actual proof will be over the scale field FP, okay? But the proof pi will be a mix of elements in FP and FQ. Okay? And that's an issue because when you, if you want to verify this proof inside your proving system, well, you will have to do arithmetic over FQ, but your proving system works over FP. So you have to do non-native arithmetic. So simulate arithmetic over FQ in the field FP. And that's usually very expensive, but you can still do it and people have done it. And that was probably like the first approach to recursion is just simulate arithmetic over FQ uh, in FP. But to make this more efficient, people have come up with um, a solution which is using cycles of elliptic curves. So a cycle of elliptic curve is uh, a pair of elliptic curves E and E prime. And the base field of E is the scalar field of E prime and vice versa. And the idea is that if you have a proof pi over E, uh, you verify it over E prime. And since uh, the scalar field of E prime is Q, uh, FQ, then you can do native arithmetic to verify um, the FQ elements of the proof pi. And if you have a proof over E prime, you verify it over E. So that's why it's a cycle. Um, so that's a nice solution, but you still have some problems. Uh, first one is that you still need to do some non-native arithmetic. So uh, as I said above, uh, the proof pi is a mix of element in FP and FQ. So by going to E prime, we take care of elements in FQ, but the element, the checks in FP, so those are the constraint checks in most programming system, those you still need to do in FP, 
And so these checks become very expensive on E prime. Okay? Um, and so you could either simulate them uh, non-natively on A prime, and but that would be expensive, or you could use some um, tricks that people have come up with, which is to defer this non-native computation until you go back to the curve E. But then that means that you need to, to at every point in time, keep track of the deferred computation. Yeah. Um, another issue with cycles is that there is no reasonable cycle of parent-friendly curves. So uh, proving systems like Growth16 or uh, original Planck are based on pairings. And so if you want to use this um, approach of cycles uh, with these schemes, you will have to use uh, very large cycles of uh, parent-friendly curves. So um, these curves will have like very large, large fields and will be like pretty inefficient uh, to use. Um, and so, yeah, I think there are some uh, theoretical results that there doesn't exist any cycles of, you know, reasonable, um, efficient peripheral curve, curves. Um, so since you cannot use uh, peripheral friendly curves, um, you have to use uh, IPA-based systems. Um, so this is the line of work that started with bulletproofs. Uh, it's a way to do polynomial commitments um, without trusted setups, but still on elliptic curves using the discrete log. Um, and, and that's, that's fine. That works. Uh, but you have some issues because the verification in bulletproofs is, uh, actually quite hard and quite expensive. So if you wanted to do the full verification recursively, uh, like the circuit will be way too large. So, um, Halo was, um, the first that uh, came up with this idea of accumulation schemes. So instead of actually verifying, um, instead of actually implementing the full verifier in the circuit, you just implement an accumulation check, and then you keep track of this accumulator. And if you want to um, finish your, your recursion, you still have to check these accumulators, right? So at any point in time, you're not, you haven't really computed a recursive proof. You have a check, you have a proof of the checks, but you still need to prove the accumulators. Yeah. Uh, but still that works. Um, and that's actually what we did in Planky one. Uh, we had uh, Planck with um, Halo-based um, IPA polynomial commitments. Yeah. Um, another issue with all these elliptic curve schemes is that elliptic curves are uh, in general quite slow um, because they work over large fields. Um, so yeah, in Planky one we had okay uh, prover times, but at some point we realized that we could do better, um, and that's where we introduced Planky two. So Planky 2 is very similar, but instead of using um, elliptic curves and um, bulletproofs, we use Fry-based polynomial commitments. Okay? And we still use uh, the Planck arithmetization. Okay. Um, and Fry, uh, most of you probably know it, it's the protocol that, uh, that's underlying uh, most Starks. And it's a protocol based on hashes. So it doesn't have any elliptic curves. Uh, the only cryptography in, in Fry is hashes. And hashes are convenient for many reasons. Uh, first one is that they're pretty fast to compute in general. Um, second is that they are defined on only one field. So the input of a hash is a bunch of field elements, and the output is a bunch of field elements, but in the same field. So uh, in, in elliptic curves, we had to deal with um, two fields, but with Fry, we have only one field, uh, which simplifies a lot of things. All right. Um, and um, another uh, good thing about Fry is that we can use small fields. Yeah. And as Brendan mentioned, uh, we can take advantage of like of the fact that CPUs are really good at uh, working with 64 bits. And so we defined a 64 bit field uh, called the Goldilocks field. Uh, that's really efficient to work with and that makes the proof really, really fast. And I think that's also the field used in Maiden and, um, and other projects. Um, so another feature is, as uh, Brendan mentioned, uh, we have what, what I call full recursion, is that as opposed to uh, accumulation schemes, at any point in time, we have a full recursive proof of all the, the chain or tree um, before. So we don't have to check any accumulators, any deferred computation. It's like in terms of engineering, it's like very simple. Uh, we just implement the verifier inside the circuit and, and we're done. 
Uh, we use custom gates. So um, that's something that's called the turbo plank automatization. Uh, so it's plank with uh, custom gates. Um, and that's really useful because uh, when we write the recursive circuit, there are a few uh, quite expensive operations. And um, we can just abstract these, com these computations away uh, by writing uh, custom gates for every expensive computation. And that's one of the reasons our um, proofs are so uh, effective. Uh, another reason is that we use a large number of columns in the Planck trace. So in the original Planck paper, they use only three columns. Um, most projects will use uh, around 10. Uh, we use 140 columns. So that's quite a lot, but it allows us, for example, to do hashing in just one row of the trace. Um, and sin since hashing is such a, is the main um, operation we have to do in Fry, um, it's really crucial to us that hashing is as efficient as possible um, in our proving system. And, and with this large number of columns, we can do hashing in, in just one row. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, otherwise a, a ton of tricks um, to make recursion efficient. Uh, one of them, for example, is we truncate all the Merkle trees. So when we verify a Merkle path, instead of going all the way to the root, uh, we truncate the path and, and stop below the root. Uh, and that makes the proof smaller and also more efficient to verify. And the result of all this uh, engineering is that we can do recursion in 2 to the 12 gates and uh, 100 millisecond, 170 millisecond on a MacBook Pro. Um, to the best of our knowledge, that's by far the, the most uh, efficient recursive proof system out there. Okay, um, so afterwards, I'm going to dive a bit into the code base, but I think now is a good time to look if there is some questions. Okay, Q&A. Are there open source implementations of Starkey? Yes, um, so Starkey is a subcrate of Planky2. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Can you explain a bit more about Merkle tree optimization? Um, sure. Um, so, so I'll do something that may not work. Uh, okay, can you see my? image of a Merkle tree. Yeah. So here, um, the Merkle tree, usually you go all the way to the top here, and you have the, this Merkle root. What you could do instead is have this, uh, not give this root as the as, as like the commitment of the Merkle tree, but have these two nodes here, these two nodes below. And that will be what we call the Merkle cap. And when you verify your Merkle path, you stop at this uh, second level, and then you verify against one of these two nodes. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know if that's clear. Um, uh, and there are also like for the proof size optimization, we, um, so when you have, so like in Fry, you have uh, a bunch of Merkle trees and you have a lot of paths in this Merkle tree. And so there is uh, quite a bit of redundancy when you go up the tree. Uh, so like you will have many times the same node. And so you can like do some uh, tree optimizations by removing the redundant node. Um, but that's just about proof sizes, not, not really efficiency. Um, do you support lookups? Uh, not in Plunky 2. Uh, we will probably support lookups in the Stark based VM. Yeah, for like uh, run checks, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, like. Uh, Bitwise operations, we will probably have lookups in the in the VM, but not in uh, the Planky two. Uh, zero knowledge. So zero knowledge, we support zero knowledge now, but it's really inefficient. We just add a bunch of random points in the trace. Um, it's not our focus right now because we don't need zero knowledge for the rollup. Uh, at some point, we're gonna make it more efficient. Uh, yeah. I think right now, like zero knowledge, you, you're better off not using zero knowledge because it makes the trace a bit uh, larger, but you can still um, do it. 
what is the benefit of stopping just before the tree root? One less hash. Yeah, basically one less hash. So like we have to do a, a ton of hashing in the recursive circuit. So like if we can remove a, uh, a few hashes, it's it's quite efficient. Far. Yeah, we we gain a lot. How does Plunky two compare with Stark? In feature limitation. So now we don't need periodic op operation. So like the the thing about Starks is that you have to do this periodic stuff and all these um, quite complicated things because you don't have wiring of um, wires. So like in Plunk, when you have two wires in the trace, you can uh, connect to them, saying I have like what we call a copy constraint. Um, so if we wanted to like simulate a periodic operation, we would just you know connect the wires periodically. We don't need that to be like uh, implemented um, in the proof system. So I mean, Plunk is really cool um, because of that, because of these uh, copy constraints. It's like very um, easy to use. Okay. I think I'll stop now and have a look at more of the engineering side. Um, so the Plunky to code base, uh, you can find it in um, on our GitHub. Um, it's written fully in Rust, and we try to use to not use uh, dependencies. So like all the crypto is is done inside Plunky two. Uh, all the field operations, uh, Fiat Shamir. Uh, IOP is like everything is done in Plunky 2. We don't need, we don't use any dependency for that. Um, and so if you go on the GitHub right now and look at the project, you'll see that we have seven sub crates. Um, the main one is called uh, Plunky 2. Uh, it uh, contains the, the proving system logic, uh, the Plunk stuff, the challenge, the um, Fiat Chimera stuff. Um, then we have the field crate, which contains the, the code for field operations uh, for the Goldilocks field, uh, all kinds of the optimization related to uh, field operations. Uh, then Starkey. So um, one person was asking about Starkey. Starkey is a part of Plunky2. Uh, and so it's a, it gives a way to define Starks that can be verified by, by Plunky2. So that's quite convenient. And one implementation of Starkey is uh, system zero. So it's still work in progress, but this will be our Stark based VM. Uh, so it's uh, an implementation of Starkey. And so it's a Stark based VM that uh, at some point will um, be able to simulate uh, the EVM for a roll up. Uh, and, and so any proof, uh, any Stark proof of this, uh, of a VM trace will be uh, verifiable by Plunky2. And then we can you know, use recursion in Plunky2. Uh, and then, yeah, we have uh, a few other crates uh, which contain some gadgets. So permutation gadgets, uh, insertion gadgets, and uh, one other. Uh, so those are gadgets that we needed at some point, but we don't need them anymore. So, but they're still there. And if you need, for example, um, a permutation gadget, we have it on uh, in the Plunky2 repo. OK, and I wanted to do a bit of, uh, of live coding because we use Plunky2 for uh, Polygon0 for our rollup, but it's actually, we actually try to make it uh, a nice proving system to use for everybody, right? So like if you want to, if in your project you need a proving system with fast recursion, fast proving time, uh, then you could definitely use Plunky2. Um, and here I'm gonna show an example of how one could use Plunky2 just as a, as a proving system for any kind of project. Um, so, and the example will be semaphore. So uh, those of you who did um, uh, puzzle one last week uh, probably know about semaphore. Um, so it's a really nice protocol for uh, membership proofs and uh, some kind of voting. So like you can give a signal that you vote for a topic uh, and that you're a member of this, um, of this uh, set. Uh, it works uh, by using an, what, what's called an access set. So the access set is just uh, the Merkle tree of a bunch of public keys, okay? Uh, and so you want to approve membership, uh, ownership, uh, I should say, of one of these public keys. Um, and so you have a secret key, SK. The public key is derived from the secret key as the hash of SK and zero. Uh, the nullifier is the hash of the secret key and the topic you want to vote on. 
And then when you want to publish the signal, uh, you publish this nullifier, and that will be um, very um, crucial to, uh, to check that you haven't voted twice. Um, and that was actually uh, what uh, puzzle one was uh, about. And then you publish also a ZKP of that all these relations uh, are correct, so that the public key is um, correctly derived, that the public key is part of the Merkle tree, uh, and that the nullifier is also correctly uh, derived. Okay, and I've published uh, this example on uh, our um, GitHub, so you can have a look afterwards. Um, where am I? All right, so here is the repo, uh, Plunky2 Semaphore. Um, so it's a Rust uh, project, of course. Uh, here you can see you can import Plunky2 directly from Git. Uh, we're not on crates.io. Uh, but we will probably be at some point. Tim, one yeah. question. Is there any you can make the font a bit bigger on this, on that part of it when you're doing code? coding stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, another so. thing that we can also do is if you turn off your video, and Brandon, if you turned off yours, I think it shows up bigger on the recording, right? So that's like a way that we're, if you're in between that now, would be a good moment to just, just turn off your video. Oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'll try to do that. Sorry to interrupt you, though. Yeah, no worries. Um, it's just the video screen or the yeah, camera. Okay. Yeah. No, that's here. The little video camera. Ah. <laughs> yeah. No. No. <laughs> there's a video. There's like a video camera. Where? Next to the microphone. Where's the microphone? <laughs> oh, at the bottom of the screen. Okay. I don't see it. Uh, I, don't, uh, I think your screen is maybe, it seems like the controls are, maybe, maybe yeah. I can do it. Let's see if I can. No, I can't do it for you. Hmm. Well, I guess we're going to have to do it as is. Yeah, sorry. No, um, no problem. Okay. Yeah, I'll make the font bigger. Um, okay, thanks for that. Yeah, no worries. I don't know how to do it, though. <laughs> um, Anybody knows IntelliJ, how to make the font bigger? <laughs> uh, Maybe a period screen? Oh, yeah, I can just use my mouse. Yeah, that's all right. All right. Um, so, uh, OK, so you can import Plunky2 from GitHub. Um, then the access set, so, so bit, Basically, um, for those of you who did puzzle one, I just transpiled uh, the code from puzzle one to Plunky2. So it should be pretty familiar if you worked on the puzzle. Um, the access set is just this Merkle tree, okay? And the, the leaves will be uh, the public keys. Um, and then I have a signal struct. Uh, the signal contains the nullifier, uh, which is a digest, and the proof, which is a Plunky proof. Here I have a bunch of types. So my field will be uh, the Goldilocks field. The Goldilocks field, my digest will be um, four field elements. Here I have a config C, which is a Poseidon Goldilocks config. So that's the main config we use for recursion because we use Poseidon, uh, which is um, arithmetic hash function and the Goldilocks field. And then the Plunky proof will be um, so that's a, that's a proof struct uh, in Plunky2, and it takes a bunch of generics. It takes the field, the config, and here two is um, at some points in Plunky2 we use extension fields, and so two will be the degree of the extension. So here we will be using uh, quadratic field ex extensions, which I, I would recommend for most projects. Uh, uh, you get uh, 100 bits of security by using um, degree two extensions. OK, and we have the signal nullifier proof. Uh, now let's see how we can compute uh, the signal. So verifying the signal is pretty easy. Uh, we just um, compute the public inputs of the proof. So the proof will have as public input the Merkle root of the access set. That's that part here. It's a bit complicated because we use caps, Merkle caps I was talking about. So like you make the codes a bit uh, ugly, but. Um, that will be the first part of the public input. Second part will be the nullifier. And then the topic topic will be also a public input. And then we have this function verify, um, which basically just verify the proof and the public input. Yeah. 
And so here you can see verifier data. So that's quite interesting. Uh, we still use Plunk. Uh, so that means that we have to, um, we have pre-processed polynomials, uh, the Plunk pre-processed pre polynomials. So we still need some, um, what is called verifier keys uh, in some proving systems to verify the proofs. Yeah. So in Storks, you wouldn't need this, but since we use Plunk, you, you need to use this verifier data. Okay, so that's the verify signal function. It's pretty, um, pretty straightforward. And so how do we make a signal? Okay, so here you can see to compute the nullifier, uh, that's what I was saying before, you just hash a private key and a topic. So um, if I go back to my slides, nullifier is the hash of the secret key and the topic. That's good. Um, then then I, I need to define, so like this is what you will do in Plunky2 is you have this config, which is a circuit config. Um, we have a bunch of configs ready for all kinds of uh, applications. Here I will use the recursion ZK config. So one person was asking me about zero knowledge in Plunky2. You can actually use zero knowledge in Plunky2. It will just be a bit inefficient, but here I, I can use it because I want to hide my secret key. Um, and uh, the recursion part means that I can also do recursion with this config. Uh, and then I define a circuit builder. Circuit builder is how you actually build your circuits in, in Plunky2. Uh, and all the gadgets in Plunky2 are methods of this circuit builder. So like if you want to build a circuit, you just uh, instantiate one and then call some gadgets. Uh, we'll see how it works later. And then partial witness is pretty cool. So, um, so the witness in Plunk is basically a table. Um, and you don't have to fill all the wires in the table, um, all the cells in the table manually. You can use this partial witness and partially fill the table with values. And then the proving system will take care of to generate the rest of the values uh, using the gadgets. So here PW, like the partial witness will, will be used to just um, give like the um, fill the data that's needed uh, in the circuit. Okay, and here the first interesting part is targets. So um, here I want to actually define a circuit for the semaphore verification. So here, that's the ZKP. I need, I need a circuit if I want a ZKP. So let's define the circuit. Um, I have this function. So first I register the public inputs. Um, I register the Merkle root. I register the nullifier and I registered the topic. Okay, those are all the public inputs we saw before. Uh, yeah, I should mention, so like we have these virtual things, so like virtual targets, virtual hash. So when you, when you want to have wires uh, in your trace, but you don't know where they, they will be in the trace um, when you instantiate them, you can um, instantiate them as virtual and then they will be uh, wired later, okay? So for most things, you can just use virtual targets and then they will be wired um, automatically. So here we have the Merkle proof, um, private key, public key index. Okay, here is our, our first gadget. Okay, so we have the public key index, but we actually need the bits, right? Because in the Merkle proof verification, uh, when, you do, when you verify this Merkle path, you need to know uh, if uh, your hash is on the left or the right, depending on the bit of the index. So we need to split this index into bits. And we have a gadget for that. And so you can call builder. And then here you will get a list of gadgets. Uh, and then this one for splitting in bits is called split LE. So LE for little Indian. Uh, and then it takes an integer and the number of bits. Here the integer will be the public key index. So public key index and then number of bits. The number of bits in the Merkle path uh, will be just the height of the tree. And so I've conveniently implemented the function for the tree height. And so that will give the number of bits, it's just the height of the tree, okay? But here what I just did is add a gadget for bit splitting. And so as you can see, it's pretty easy. You have this builder, builder uh, the circuit builder, and then you can just um, call gadgets directly from the builder. Okay, uh, and then I want to verify this Merkle proof. So uh, this Merkle proof for the, private, the public key. Um, and so there is, of course, a gadget for that. So I do verify Merkle proof. The, ver the Merkle proof takes leaf data. So the leaf data will be the, um, the private key 
and a bunch of zeros, four zeros, okay. And then I concatenate them. That will give uh, the leaf data. And uh, what else do I need? Um, the bits, okay. That's convenient. I just computed the bits, public uh, index bits. Okay, what else do I need? Um, the Merkle cap and the proof, okay. So the Merkle cap, I just do uh, Merkle cap uh, target and then Merkle root. So yeah, as I said, this is because of the cap thing. So we don't use Merkle root, we use Merkle caps and this makes um, things a bit inconvenient, but basically you can think of the cap as just a root and then I need the Merkle proof. Okay, everything is red, which is not a good sign. <laughs> Yeah. It's a bunch of references. Okay, now it should work. Okay, and the final uh, gadget I will use is the, what I call should be nullifier. So we need to check that the nullifier is uh, computed correctly as the hash of the secret key and the topic. And I'll just do that uh, with the hashing gadget in the circle builder. Uh, we have a gadget called uh, hash and to hash notepad. So you can hash um, any uh, a vector of inputs of any uh, size to a hash uh, and you don't do any padding. And so that will be, I said the secret key, so the private key and the topic. And normally I can just concatenate them. All right, cool. And then what I do is I connect. So like, yeah, I was uh, as I was saying before, like in Plunk, you have copy constraints, so you can connect uh, wires. And here I will connect these nullifier um, elements with the should be nullifier. And since the digest as size four, I do that. Uh, I loop over zero to four, and then I connect these elements. Yeah, and then I will um, return all these targets. Um, and so these targets are just wire in the trace, but I've never actually uh, filled the, these wires with actual values. And so I need to do that at some point. And I do that in the fill semaphore target uh, function, which is called right after this semaphore circuit um, function. And um, it's not very interesting. <laughs> I just have these functions which are uh, PW is the partial witness and we set the targets. Uh, so like we have the private key target, which is the, the wires representing the private key. Uh, and then we just set them to the actual private key. So here you can see private key is like um, a bunch of targets and, pri and private key, the actual private key is a bunch of field elements or a digest in this case. So I can just set them one by one. And then I have everything um, that I need. And, and here I have a small test. Um, and you can run this test. Uh, let's try to see if it works. It doesn't. Oh well. Um, verify Merkle proof. Uh, okay. Um, so here, when I verify the Merkle proof, I need to uh, say which hash function I use. And normally, if I specify that I use the Poseidon hash. It should work. Okay, I need to also specify which hash function I use for this uh, gadget. All right, seems to be compiling. Okay, it works. Um, it works, and what test uh, did I just run? Um, I didn't uh, mention it. So the test is pretty similar to what you've seen in, in puzzle one. I generate a bunch of private keys, around a million private keys. Then I um, do I uh, derive the public keys. As you can see, it's the, the hash of the secret key on a bunch of zeros. Uh, I compute the access set. And then here I, I will do the proof for the 12th uh, um, private key. I generate a random topic and then I make the signal and then I verify the signal. Okay. So it was probably a bit unclear, but yeah, as I said, um, 
Everything is on GitHub. You can have a look if you want. And don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions. We have a Discord uh, of Polygon Zero. If you have questions about Plunky 2 or like how about this example, I'd be happy to help. Um, do we have time to take questions, Anna? I believe so. Let me just double check the schedule, but I think so. We have like 15 minutes or so, right? Oh, awesome. Um, OK, what is the difference between System 0 and Maiden? Um, they're very similar. Uh, it's stock-based VM. I think Maiden is more uh, stack-based, so it uh, does a lot of stack operations. Um, and we don't do as many stack operations, uh, but they are very similar. Um, and they, they both have the same goal of of um, of being used in a rollup for a DEVM. Yeah. Do you provide a compiler assembler ecosystem for System Zero? Uh, not yet, but we're working on it. Um, we're working on a transpiler from uh, not a transpiler, a compiler from Yule. Okay, so Yule is a intermediate language from Solidity, so you can compile from Solidity to Yule and then to Yule to System Zero. Uh, and that will be the, the pipeline used in the rollup uh, of Polygon Zero. What are the disadvantages of Plunky 2 compared with just using Turbo or Ultra Plunky? Um, so, if you mean Turbo or Ultra Plunky, as in um, like Aztec is doing with pairings, is that um, pairings are really hard to verify uh, recursively. So Plunky 2 is really designed for recursion. It's not uh, the fastest uh, verifier. It's not the, um, the smallest proofs, but it's the best proving system for recursion. So if you need recursion, then Plunky 2 is the way. Uh, otherwise, yeah, Turbo or Ultra Plunk are also good systems. But I mean, you could say that Plunky 2 is just a variant of Turbo Plunk. Um, can you explain public key index and bits? Yeah, sure. So. So you know, like when you verify your Merkle path, uh, you go up the tree and you go either right or left, depending on on where you are in the tree. And right or left is I represent this as a bit. And so, um, so when when you have the index of your public key in the tree, then you just need to split it into bits, uh, and and you need a gadget for that. But the gadget is pretty easy, right? So you you split your number into bits, and then you verify the constraint is just that. Uh, you know, like the first bit plus the second bit times two plus the second, the third bit times four, and so on equals the original number. Yeah. When will be when will the first version of Pocket to Crates be released? Uh, I don't know. Probably pretty soon. Uh, we just need to publish it to Crates.io and probably clean some things. Um, does Starkey already support recursion? Yes. So when you define a Stark in Starkey. You will have to um, define the constraints, the stock constraints, okay? Uh, and you you also have to um, define the recursive stock constraints. So how to um, compute the constraints in Plunky two, okay? And and when you do that, then afterwards, uh, automatically Plunky two can verify the stock. Yeah. So it's actually pretty cool um, how we can just define any kind of stocks, and then it will be easy to to recursively verify in Plunky2. OK. No more questions? <laughs>